Hello, I'm General Colin Powell. Welcome to Held in Trust. After the Civil War, Congress authorized the raising of four regiments of black soldiers to help settle the American West. The regiments were the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry. The troopers were known as the Buffalo Soldiers, and they wrote a rich chapter in American military history. One of those Buffalo Soldiers was Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper. He was the first black graduate of West Point, and his life story is one of trial and triumph of despair and faith. It is a story that I hope will inspire you, it will remind you of our past, and it will show you how far we have come. Here is Held in Trust, the life story of Henry O. Flipper, narrated by the distinguished actor, Mr. Ossie Davis. Henry Ossian Flipper. He was born on March 21st, 1856, in Thomasville, Georgia. And although he came into the world a slave, Henry had the rare opportunity to become one of history's most important black Americans. As the first black graduate of West Point, Henry seized the opportunity and made tremendous strides for black America. And then, just as his army career began to soar, a court-martial caused Lieutenant Henry Flipper to lose the one thing most dear to him, his commission as the first black officer in the United States Army. Was his punishment just? Or just a way to get rid of a young black lieutenant who broke the barrier? It is 1919, and Henry Flipper is now 63 years old. He sits alone in an El Paso, Texas hotel room packing for an assignment in Washington, D.C. His country has called on him again as a Spanish translator and interpreter for the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. It should be a positive time in Flipper's life, but finding a letter he wrote 20 years before reminds him that his mission to clear his name is not over yet. The letter reads, it might properly be asked why I have, I have not, not prior, prior to, to this, this occasion, occasion sought the rectification of the wrong which I perceive has been done me. Why have I suffered quietly? Of these questions I will say that I was thoroughly humiliated, discouraged and heartbroken at the time of my dismissal from the service. Upon reflection, it was clear that I was not sufficiently removed from the prejudices of the time. I had no army or political influence sufficiently powerful to present my case in its true aspect, and I preferred to go forth into the world and by my subsequent conduct as an honorable man and by my character disprove the charges. Having been educated by the government of the United States, and being the first of my race to be so educated and feeling it my duty, I venture to come before your committee and ask at your hands the just and impartial consideration of the facts I have presented. I thank you very much for your consideration and I remain yours, Henry Ossian Flipper. You know, I wrote that letter 20 years ago in 1898. And here it is, 1919. And I'm still trying to get my case heard. It just goes to prove the worst thing about politicians is they get elected. Some of you may know me. I am. Henry Ossian Flipper, the first colored graduate of West Point. Not the first to attend, mind you, but I was the first to graduate. I was 50th in a class of 76. Not the best, but not the worst. 
I was born into slavery in 1856. My mother, Isabella Buckhalter, and I were the property of Reverend Reuben H. Lucky, a Methodist minister in Thomasville, Georgia. During the Civil War, my mother was hired to cook for Union officers. I used to watch the soldiers march. Their uniforms were grand. They even kept the buttons shining. I believe that's when I first decided that I wanted to be a soldier. Henry's father, Festus Flipper, belonged to Ephraim G. Ponder, a successful slave trader and manufacturer. As a Ponder slave, Festus Flipper was allowed to learn a skill and even contract his free time. The elder Flipper prospered as a shoemaker and carriage trimmer. This unusual arrangement for a slave gave Festus the chance to buy Isabel and Henry from Reverend Lucky, keeping his family together when Ponder moved to Atlanta to marry a woman there. Ponder's marriage didn't last long. He moved back to Thomasville, but under a prenuptial contract, neither Ponder nor his wife could sell anything without the other's consent. Mrs. Ponder made no decision regarding the slaves. So, left to fend for themselves, they developed their skills into businesses of their own. One slave had a basic education and obtained permission to open a night school in the woodshop. There, at the age of eight, young Henry Flipper learned to read and write. And he read of a president named Lincoln, who, on January 1st, 1863, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that all persons held as slaves were free. It was astounding. Negroes were allowed to travel freely about in uniforms and with guns, guns that white men had given them. As I look back on that period, more than 50 years, it seems that we have progress by leaps and bounds as a race. And paradoxically, we are still in the dark ages. I don't know, and I did not know then, of course, the infinite amount of patience it would take, nor how infuriating it could be. In any event, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. As General Sherman's Union Army approached Atlanta, Mrs. Ponder and the slaves took refuge in Macon. Then, in the spring of 1865, after the surrender of the Confederacy, the Flippers returned to Atlanta, where Festus fulfilled his greatest ambition to see Henry and his younger brothers receive a proper education. The boys were tutored for a short time by the wife of an ex-Confederate officer. Then they attended the schools of the American Missionary Association, including Atlanta University. It would be here, while a member of the freshman class, that Henry would receive his appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. I can still remember sitting in my father's workshop when I overheard a conversation about a West Point cadet representing our district. It was the fall of 1872. He'd be graduating in June. There'd be a vacancy. I decided to apply. Flipper's application raised interest, and most of it wasn't positive. He was harassed by hostile whites who resented his appointment. He was even offered a bribe of $5,000 by a white father who thought his son should receive the honor. In April of 1873, family physician Dr. Thomas Powell of Atlanta examined and certified that Henry had met the Academy's physical requirements. He was also tested for his academic ability and passed. Six days later, Congressman J.C. Freeman sent the nomination to the Secretary of War. And on May 25, 1873, 
Henry Flipper was privileged to receive his appointment to the West Point Military Academy. It might seem unusual that a young man like myself could have such lofty aspirations. But all of us, me and my four brothers, had similar dreams of success. They became a landowner, a professor, a physician, and a bishop in the Methodist Church. But I wanted to serve my country as an officer in the United States Army. I was ready for my country, but was my country ready for me? The United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Here a first year cadet, or plebe as they're called, begins his day at the sound of reveille and roll call at five o'clock each morning. A typical day is followed by cleaning, breakfast, marching, exercise, squad drills, classes, evening parades, supper, sentinel of duty, and homework. Henry Flipper was ready for the rigors of the point, but as he arrived by ferry boat down the Hudson River, he shuddered. As a young cadet, he knew the next four years would be an uphill battle, both physically and mentally. But as a young black cadet, Flipper faced the added pressure of bigotry. And it all began the moment he was seen walking from the adjutant's office to the barracks. His first impression was certainly not encouraging. The windows were crowded with cadets watching his every move. He was jeered by some, snubbed by others. Though Flipper was to become the first black graduate of West Point, five others preceded him as cadets. But by the time Henry arrived on May 20th, 1873, only James Webster Smith remained. On his second day at West Point, Henry Flipper received a discouraging letter from Smith. In it, Smith advised Henry that if he had any hopes of graduating, he should keep to himself and never argue with any of his white classmates. Failure to do so had been Smith's downfall from the beginning. Smith was soon expelled, unofficially for striking back at his tormentors, officially for failing grades. This left Henry Flipper as the only black cadet at West Point. Flipper's story is one of the most disgraceful chapters in U.S. military history. Though he survived the hostility of the other cadets, the lack of friendship, and even a fight for food at the dinner table, Flipper kept a positive attitude. I had wanted to keep my textbooks throughout my military career. So I'd had them bound in expensive leather with a fancy hand tool design around my initials. And a young cadet whom I knew asked if he could borrow several of them. It was one of the few times that I was ever asked for anything. So I gladly lent them to him. At the end of the term, when he returned my books to me, he had ripped the covers off so no one would know that he had borrowed books from H.O.F. Now, it wasn't this act that bothered me. It was the thought that a future officer in the United States Army had so little character or backbone as to be concerned about what others thought of who his acquaintances were. Of course, life wasn't easy for any plebe. There always seemed to be chamber pots to dump, floors to clean, upperclassmen to kowtow to. Anyone in my form was put up on. And perhaps I did have a bit more trouble than the others. But that was all right, too. I didn't have to go to West Point to learn that. Any Negro who was striving to improve himself in any field in the late 1870s underwent similar experiences. Henry Flipper's mistreatment from white cadets continued throughout his four years at West Point. Never was he able to escape the harassment so he could concentrate on his studies. Never was he treated as an equal, but rather as a social outcast. <laughs> 
My worst year at the point was as a second classman during my junior year. Sometimes it was a wretched existence. From October 1875 to May 1876, I don't recall speaking to a female of any age. There was no society for me at all. No friends, male or female, for me to visit. So absolute was my isolation. I even learned to hate the holidays. The other cadets would go off rowing, skating or visiting, and there was nothing left for me to do except walk around the grounds, which I sometimes did. More often, I remained in my quarters. At those times, the barracks would be deserted, and I would get so lonely I wouldn't know what to do. But I thought, if I cannot endure persecution and prejudice, then I don't deserve the cadetship. In spite of everything, Henry dug into his studies. He learned philosophy, chemistry, engineering, and military tactics. He also improved his horseback riding skills. In the summer of 1876, another black cadet, Johnson Chestnut Whittaker of Camden, South Carolina, arrived at West Point. They shared quarters until Henry's graduation the following year. Henry's influence was apparent in Whittaker, who followed Flipper's example of ignoring insults while standing his ground when his rights were infringed upon. As June of 1877 approached, Henry Flipper went through the rigors of final exams. Now, as the end of his schooling neared, the whole nation became interested in West Point's first black graduate. One by one, Henry Ossian Flipper passed his finals, showing the rest of the country that an African-American was capable of graduating from West Point. On June 14, 1877, as Cadet Flipper marched up to accept his diploma, a huge cheer went up from his classmates. Major General John Scorfield, West Point's superintendent, gave tribute to Flipper's persistence during his commencement speech, stating, no white cadet had ever been burdened with the hopes of an entire race on his shoulders. Anyone knows how quietly and bravely this young man has borne the difficulties of his position how he had to stand apart from his classmates as one of them, but not of them. This was among the proudest moments of my life, before or since. I look back on my four years at West Point as a bittersweet experience of patient endurance and hard and persistent work, with bright oases of happiness, as well as barren waste of isolation and loneliness. But let me tell you this. The newspapers had a field day. First colored graduate, they trumpeted. A fluke, some said. Poor dear boy, said some. So mistreated by his classmates. The truth is, I couldn't wait to leave there. To go home and to see my folks and then report to whatever station they saw fit to assign to me. Maybe I would go to the western frontier to fight Indians, or perhaps to, well, whatever was my fate. I was determined to be the best soldier I could. Now, the southwest frontier offered opportunities for Negroes that were not available back east, and I was anxious for the opportunity to pioneer, if you will but I just could not escape the notoriety of being the only Negro officer in the entire United States Army. I would be stared at, sniffed at, gawked at, scrutinized wherever I went. I was the curiosity of the century. Since the early days of America, blacks have served with honor in our military. Their patriotism and ability was proven during the Civil War when over 200,000 served in the Union Army, members of the Colored Volunteer Regiments. In 1866, 
Congress passed legislation allowing African Americans to join the peacetime army, but only in special units. Of them, the 9th and 10th all-black cavalry regiments were scattered across the Texas Plains and within Indian territory. They were far removed from established cities. Their job was to maintain order between the Indians and the settlers, to help build forts and roads, patrol borders and protect mail deliveries and railroad construction crews. The army outfitted its black soldiers with old rifles and worn out horses, usually cast off from the favored 7th Cavalry of General Custer. But even though they were faced with difficult assignments and continuing prejudice, their record of service is impressive. Colonel Benjamin Grierson was the white leader who led the 10th Cavalry. From the beginning, he complained about the treatment his soldiers received, but the army ignored him. Grierson was committed to his men and for 22 years did all he could to make the 10th Cavalry's hard and lonely life tolerable. He predicted that sooner or later, these soldiers would meet with due recognition and reward. It wasn't hard to recruit the soldiers. It was hard to get good ones. Most were ignorant and illiterate, and many were poor physical specimens. In those miserable days of poverty, for a colored man to be guaranteed food, clothing, $13 a month was riches indeed. But out of this misery emerged some of the toughest and hardest fighting units in the entire army. No detachment ever bolted under fire or failed to do its duty. The desertion rate was among the lowest in the entire army, and chronic drunkenness, the scourge in some of the white units, was almost unknown. Yes, they called these men the Buffalo Soldiers. No one's quite sure how all that got started, but most of us think that it came from the Indians who had never seen men with hair like ours and likened it to the buffalo. Now, that might seem insulting to some people, but consider this. The buffalo was a sacred and respected animal to the Indians, and perhaps they respected us as well. In any event, the name became so popular that the buffalo is the foremost image on the regimental crest of the 10th Cavalry. The Buffalo Soldiers' Day started at 5.20 a.m. with the sound of the trumpeter blowing reveille. It lasted until well after dark. Some even longer after dark, taking lessons learning to read and to write usually taught by the regiment's chaplain. Well, the Buffalo Soldiers came to the Plains country in 1867. I came in 1878 to join my regiment, a raw, green as grass, second lieutenant at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Indian country. I was in the 10th Regiment, Atrium. Now, Fort Sill was in the heart of Indian country, and the Buffalo soldiers whom I joined had been waging Indian wars there for years. The 10th Regiment, as well as the 9th, were the two colored regiments, and the Negroes, even more so than the whites, could not believe an army officer with my skin. I was quite surprised to find that I was accepted by the white officers, it seemed like the more they came to know me, the more they found me worthy of my position. Like most of the forts of the late 1800s, Fort Sill was laid out in a large quadrangle with a parade ground in the center. It looked like a neat and orderly post, but actually, living conditions were quite primitive. Since he had arrived a few weeks ahead of his troops, Henry familiarized himself with the post and worked on his book, The Colored Cadet at West Point. Publishers seemed it only natural 
that the country's interest in Henry Flipper would translate into a successful book. I remember one of my first duties at Fort Sill was to arrest an Indian. General Davidson, the post commander, had ordered an infantry lieutenant out to make the arrest. I forget what the Indian had done, but the lieutenant, well, he was ungentlemanly. So much so that the Indians thought well enough to fire on him, and they did. He came stomping back and recommended full strength, a retaliation party, and a few other things. Had we been in Texas at the time, he'd have asked for the Rangers, I'm sure. But fortunately, the post commander was a wise and temperate man. And since we were under a very tenuous peace at the time, he decided to try again, this time with me. I was sent into their midst with 10 men whom I ordered to wait behind me. I disarmed myself, and having only a slight knowledge of the Kiowa language, I went up to them. I brought them a gift of coffee, and I told them the man I was after must stand trial. I gave them my word, a fair trial. If he was innocent, he'd be returned to them. But if he is guilty, he must be punished. The Indians trusted my honesty and took me to my word. And with two of their people to accompany us, we made our way back to Fort Sill with my prisoner peaceably in tow. That meeting was very special to me. It was important because it reinforced something I already knew. I was a colored officer in a world populated entirely by whites. For the most part, they were courteous and when warranted by rank, respectful. But I was always different. Even in the eyes of the Indians, I was always under the closest scrutiny for anything that I might do that seemed even slightly off the line. And beyond that, by my behavior, my whole race and the future of other Negroes in the military depended on how I behaved myself. It was as if this privilege had been given to me as a test to hold and trust with the hope that I might make well with it. And I tried. Believe me, I tried. I tried to respond to orders as quickly, completely, and thoroughly as I could. I didn't always like the comments and the innuendos that came with them, but then I never joined the service with the idea that life was going to be a soft and downy bed for me. So why complain? Besides, silence is more than golden. It aggravates the blue devil out of your enemies. From the start, Henry got along extremely well with his troop commander, Captain Nicholas Nolan, a tough professional soldier from Ireland. He was the regiment's most experienced Indian fighter. Soon after his arrival at Fort Sill, Captain Nolan went to San Antonio, where he married Annie Dwyer. He brought his new 21-year-old bride and her sister, Molly Dwyer, back to Fort Sill. The family insisted that Henry board with them, and Henry, the bachelor, agreed. Though the arrangement caused talk among the fort, Henry was grateful for his first real friendship since entering West Point. He soon became good friends with Molly. The two were often seen horseback riding together. Molly was a true friend. 
She never seemed to notice the comments that went along with being my acquaintance. And she was the first person, not of a higher rank than myself, that took an interest in my work. Molly Dwyer. She was just as Irish as her name. And she could hold her own, too, when she and I and some of the other officers would go riding and chasing the jackrabbits and the coyotes with the trained greyhounds that we kept at the fort. This was the Western version of the English fox hunt. Still, I worried for her reputation, being seen with a Negro. Even though we were just good friends, she was taking a risk. But being Irish, she had her own head about what was proper, not to mention a good left hook. And so, friends, we remained. <laughs> Still, it wasn't comfortable. Lieutenant Charles Nordstrom considered her his own private property, and he didn't take too kindly to me. And when I told Molly about this, she replied, Surely, Lieutenant Flipper, you know that President Lincoln freed the slaves. And so, we both just laughed and continued to chase the jackrabbits. Those were wonderful times. <laughs> Early in 1879, Henry's troop was ordered to Fort Elliott, Texas, where Captain Nolan made Flipper his adjutant, the ranking officer of the commander's staff. Henry also found time to map and survey the post, and helped build a telegraph line from Fort Elliott to Fort Supply. In November, Flipper's troop returned to Fort Sill, where for four months, Henry served as acting captain of Company G. His engineering skills were tested when asked to take over the construction of a new road from the post to the railroad station in Gainesville. A month later, he made his most important contribution to Fort Sill, the construction of a ditch that would drain stagnant pools of water away from the fort. Whenever I rode with Molly, we always noticed a bad problem with stagnant pools of water at the fort. Every rainy season, the men were plagued with malaria. Many of them died from it. I even got my own system full of it one year. So I designed a runoff that looked like it was running uphill when it was completed. And it caused a lot of comment. We worked for weeks regrading the land and digging the ditch with the assistance of a full troop of cavalry soldiers. When it was finished, the commanding officer and some of the other officers came down to look it over. We got down in the ditch and the general told me that I had it running uphill, that the grade was wrong. Well, it certainly looked that way, but I knew I was right. And when the first rains came, the water flowed away as smoothly as a sled on snow. I understand the men at Fort Sill still call it Flipper's Ditch. Now, this may not seem like any great tribute, but Molly was impressed. Not because they named the ditch after me, but because of the work itself. The work. It was nice. The success of Henry's ditch in eliminating malaria at Fort Sill is still noted today. Flipper's Ditch was named a National Historic Landmark on October 27, 1977, almost a century after it was created. A large bronze plaque commemorates what turned into an ingenious and successful solution to a serious problem. I always accepted the travel involved with being a soldier. I expected it, but that didn't make it any easier for me to accept my orders to leave Fort Sill. It was as if I were leaving home. Here I had begun my career. Here I had grown from a young, green, inexperienced officer to one with a little more confidence in himself. And here I had made friends, friends whom I believe accepted me as I was and who respected me regardless of my color. 
On the day we were to leave, my troop went ahead of me. I went out along the road as it left Fort Sill and goes up along a rise, a road that Molly and I rode often. And when I reached the top, I stopped. I turned around and I said goodbye. And it was, to the best of my knowledge, the last time in my adult life that I wept. The Buffalo Soldier's motto, ready and forward, was tested when Flipper and Troop A were ordered to Fort Concho in Texas. Upon their arrival, they joined up with other soldiers of the 9th and 10th Cavalry on a military campaign against Chief Victorio and the Warm Springs Apaches. Victorio was on the warpath throughout Texas and New Mexico. Oh, Chief Victorio, he was fast as lightning and ferocious as a wildcat. Now, I've talked to men who fought against Victorio as well as Geronimo. They all preferred Geronimo. One morning, Victorio and his followers surprised a detachment of a lieutenant and 10 men, killed most of them, and left the survivors to make it to us in their underclothing. Now, Captain Nolan sent me with two men and dispatches to Colonel Grierson, our commander over at Eagle Springs. We rode 98 miles in 22 hours. I felt no ill effects from the ride until I tried to dismount from my horse. I couldn't. I fell flat on the ground. Colonel Grierson received the information I brought, and one of the other men gave me a blanket where I lay, and I slept until the morning sun warmed my face. Lieutenant Flipper's heroic ride to warn Colonel Grierson paid off. Grierson pushed Victorio into Mexico, where he and his men were cornered by the Mexican cavalry. As a reward for his services in the field, Henry was sent to a new post, Fort Davis, Texas. Here, Colonel Nolan named him post quartermaster and acting commissary of subsistence. It was a big promotion for Flipper, but one that would be short-lived as jealousy and the change in command would soon overshadow his accomplishments. Fort Davis was established in 1854 to protect settlers, mail carriers, and other supplies traveling westward along the road that led from San Antonio to El Paso. Unlike Fort Sill on the American prairie, Fort Davis is a rugged encampment. Lieutenant Henry Flipper adapted quickly to his new life and new responsibilities. He received praise from fellow officers and even local merchants who liked the way he did business. At Fort Davis, I was in charge of the entire military fort. Housing, fuel, water, transportation, and all supplies, as well as commissary. I was quite happy with my new job, but I felt the camaraderie that I had at Fort Sill was gone. And to make matters worse, I had to share quarters with Lieutenant Nordstrom. Remember him? He kept hopping into my life, usually making it miserable. He hated me, it was said, as much for being as equal in rank as for my friendship with Miss Molly Dwyer, who moved to the fort with Captain Nordstrom's household. At Fort Davis, Nordstrom became my bitter enemy. He resented my friendship with Molly and proclaimed his love for her. Some of the other officers sided with him and blamed me for her refusal of his marriage proposals. Mary Nordstrom? Huh, she deserved better than that. Whatever Henry's feelings were toward Molly Dwyer, her feelings toward him began to change. Eventually, she accepted Nordstrom's proposal, much to Henry's bitter disappointment. But this was just the beginning of the changes in Flipper's life. On March 12, 1881, Colonel William R. Shafter assumed command of the post. Shafter 
who had earned the name Pecos Bill from his successful operations against the Indians, was a superb officer, but he had the reputation for harassing the subordinates he didn't like. Shafter was a harsh field soldier who didn't want to be burdened by the routine day-to-day -day administration of the post. So the entire commissary accounting fell totally on Lieutenant Flipper. Some of his civilian friends warned him that Lieutenant Nordstrom and his best friend, Lieutenant Louis Wilhelmy, were planning a trap. But as in the past, Henry ignored the warnings. Then Henry's life changed forever. One day, Colonel Shafter called me into his office, and at once he relieved me as the quartermaster. And then he said he'd replace me as the commissary as soon as he found an officer for the place. The scent was in the wind. He and Nordstrom, a man who had been court-martialed many times for his harsh treatment of Negroes, were the wolves baying for my blood. Now, friends had warned me of what they were up to, but I couldn't believe it. Never did a man walk a straighter path of righteousness than I, but the trap was cunningly laid. Now, I was sure that I'd be relieved in a few days, but it stretched into weeks. Then in May 1881, Colonel Shafter ordered me to move the funds from the commissary and quartermaster safe to my personal quarters. I thought this was an unusual request, but I complied with my colonel's wishes and secured the funds in my personal trunk. Then in July, I was going over my commissary statements and I discovered a $1,400 shortage. I knew that two or $300 was owed by some of the soldiers, but I had no idea where the rest of the money had gone. I was afraid to consult the commanding officer or any of the other officers of the post because of my peculiar situation. And because I had heard stories from civilians about the post that officers were plotting to get me out of the army, and because I had seen other officers like Wilhammy and Nordstrom prowling around my quarters at unseemly hours of the night. I suspected foul play, but I decided to make up the difference with my personal check of $1,440.43. Now, that's a lot of money for a young soldier to possess, but it was owed to me as a royalty check, payment for my West Point autobiography. Unfortunately, while waiting for my royalty check, the chief commissary of the Department of Texas contacted Colonel Shafter. He wanted to know why the July funds had not been sent. The colonel decided to investigate, and I was about to be sacrificed. After ordered a search of Flipper's quarters, they seized his ledger, commissary funds, checks, and even some of his personal property, including his West Point ring. As two officers rifled through his belongings, Henry stood by helplessly. The Army's only black officer, Lieutenant Henry Flipper, was arrested, and a report was filed recommending court-martial. Shafter placed him in the felon's cell in the guardhouse, a stone room six and a half feet long by four and a half feet wide. The cell was so small, the slats of his bunk had to be cut off to fit it inside. Colonel Shafter prohibited Henry any visitors, even denying him bedding, books, and writing materials. Then he added up the amount of missing money, the seized funds, and the credit issued to the soldiers. It came $3,791.77, the amount Shafter publicly accused Henry of stealing. 
Shafter filed two charges against Flipper. The first accused him of embezzling. The second charge was conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. The news spread quickly throughout the Fort Davis settlement. Shafter hinted that if Flipper's friends could collect enough money, he might drop all charges. So, residents quickly came to his aid, donating enough to make full restitution of the missing funds. Shafter released Henry to his quarters, but his troubles were far from over. It was there that he stayed until September 17, 1881, the day the court martial convened in the Fort Davis Chapel. Flipper was to face a 10-member board, three of whom worked directly for Colonel Shafter. The prosecution's case was weak, due partly to lack of physical evidence proving embezzlement and Colonel Shafter's contradictions in his testimony. Henry's lawyer, Captain Merritt Barber, attributed the disappearance of the funds to Flipper's inexperience in financial matters, stating that under Shafter's lax command, his responsibilities were too much for the young lieutenant to assume alone. Barber read from a letter from Henry's former commander, Colonel Benjamin Grierson, stating, Flipper's character and standing as an officer and gentleman was beyond reproach. 28 days into the trial, Lieutenant Henry Flipper read from a prepared statement. Of crime, I am not guilty. I have no privity or knowledge and am not responsible except to make the amount good. And that I have done. On a cold December 8, 1881, the all-white court made their decision. They found Lieutenant Henry Flipper not guilty of embezzlement, but guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Flipper was sentenced to a dishonorable discharge, denied the one thing he wanted in his life, to be an officer in the United States Army. Conduct unbecoming. Embezzlement would have been better. If I'd been convicted of that, it would have been something I could deal with. But how could I prove what was not true? That I behaved with conduct unbecoming an officer. The verdict was comforting to some, I suppose. For at least it proved to them that no colored man could be an officer. Just as quickly as that, I was no longer a, an officer, no longer a soldier. I simply ceased to be in the Army. America's first black graduate of West Point, the first black officer in the U.S. Army, and the hero of the Buffalo Soldiers, brought his case before President Chester A. Arthur, but his plea for leniency was ignored. And on June 30th, 1882, Henry Ossian Flipper was dismissed from military service, and the officer corps of the United States Army became all white again. There was nothing else to be done, so I sold my horses and army gear, and I went to El Paso. I spoke Spanish well, and a white gentleman I knew named A.Q. Wingo, a man I had known in the army. He was hired by an American company to do some survey work in Mexico. He sent for me. Well, Wingo had only told the company that he wanted a good engineer. And when the company found out that the good engineer was a man of color, there was some resistance. But Wingo proved to be more than a friend. He was a man of firm resolve. He made one simple statement, with him or without me. A sought-after expert in his field, soon Henry opened his own engineering firm in Nogales, Arizona. He even became the editor of the Nogales Sunday Herald. Through his engineering work, Henry became very familiar with Mexican and Spanish laws regarding land ownership. 
His expert testimony helped save the property of hundreds of Nogales homeowners. This led to Henry's appointment as a special agent for the Department of Justice in 1893. He worked surveying land claims and translating thousands of Spanish documents to English. Some of his translations still stand today. He was even commissioned to write a multi-volume history of mining in Mexico. In 1919, Henry Flipper served as translator and interpreter for the Senate Subcommittee on Mexican Affairs. His abilities led to an appointment as assistant to the Secretary of the Interior. A man of vast knowledge and strong character, Henry confronted both prejudice and tradition to become the first of his race to conquer fields that had previously been closed to blacks. I had always wanted to pursue a retrial of my case, so I kept up a letter writing campaign to this person and to that one. All attempts were unsuccessful. Very simply, I wanted to serve my country. Of course, I wanted to clear my name. My case lay on the desk of men who could have helped and wouldn't. In the meantime, my old unit, the 10th, distinguished itself with great skill and courage. I was unspeakably proud of them. Well, those days are over now. The buffalo are mostly gone. The Indians are mostly peaceful. We don't need horses anymore. We got trains and those terrifying aeroplanes that made the Great War so hard. And I'm seeing more and more automobiles, even on El Paso's dusty streets. Progress is inescapable. I hope that progress has some time for me and for my case. The Negro soldier has served his country as honorably, reliably, and courageously as any man who's ever put on the uniform of the U.S. military. Just like in the old days, days in the 10th Cavalry, when we were all Buffalo soldiers. When he was 74, Henry Flipper retired and moved to Atlanta with his brother Joseph. Though he very rarely left home, he continued to keep a daily routine, working in his study, writing, and answering his mail. On the morning of April 26, 1940, Henry did not greet the family cook as he had always done. When Joseph Flipper's son, Charles, finally opened the door, the two realized something was wrong. A few minutes later, they found Henry, almost dressed for the day, lying across his bed, dead of a heart attack. Henry Ossian Flipper was 84 years old. While almost every major newspaper announced his graduation from West Point in 1877, only three noted his passing. The latter daily word remarked, he died unwept, unhonored, unsung. On his death certificate, his brother Joseph gave him in death what he so wanted in life. And the spaces for name and occupation, he wrote, Henry O. Flipper, retired army officer. 30 years after Flipper's death, Ray McCall, a Georgia school teacher, became interested in the accounts of Henry's life. McCall, together with Ursley King, Flipper's niece, decided to make one final attempt to restore Henry's good name. He argued that if Henry was found innocent of embezzling government funds, then he should not have been found guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, since the second charge was dependent upon the first. On December 13, 1976, the board reversed its 94-year-old decision and recommended the Army grant Second Lieutenant Henry Ossian Flipper an honorable discharge dated June 30, 1882. The reversal did not go unnoticed by the Military Academy at West Point. The following year, 
West Point commemorated the 100th anniversary of Flipper's graduation, designating each February 10th as Henry O. Flipper Day. A permanent display honoring Henry Flipper was established in the West Point Library. And each year, an award is presented to a graduating cadet who best typifies Henry Flipper's attributes. On February 11th, 1978, Henry Flipper's remains were exhumed from his unmarked grave in Atlanta and brought home to Thomasville, Georgia, where he was buried with full military honors. Friends, relatives, and military officials gathered at the First Missionary Baptist Church to pay their respects. At Old Magnolia Cemetery, the sounds of a 21-gun salute echoed over a flag-draped casket honoring Henry Ossian Flipper, an extraordinary soldier who epitomized every black man of courage. <laughs>